Hello. Another episode of Star Trek Discovery, another review. There will be spoilers ahead for Episode 8, The Sanctuary. We saw the most space action we've seen for a while this time, and this week sees the crew take their first steps in involving themselves with the much foreshadowed Osira, who is revealed to be an Orion woman. No surprise there. The Orion Syndicate and people in general were revealed in Enterprise to be a matriarchal society who masqueraded aspects of their culture in order to manipulate others. This far into the future, the Emerald Chain, as the presumed evolution of the Syndicate, has shed that pretense. Saru points out how hypocritical Osira is for practicing slavery as her ancestors were slaves themselves, which has been true in Beta Canon for some time, but I think this is the first mention we've had of the Orion's history proper. I've done two videos on them before, both on their culture and the Syndicate, but suffice to say the Orion people were forcibly taken from their homeworld before they escaped slavery and began to mimic the only culture they had been exposed to for centuries, that of their captors. With time, they bent that too to their own ends, but yeah, they have a messed up history. In terms of Osira's presence, it's a little cliche villain with her killing off those who failed her, but she'll do as an antagonist. I'd just like to see more than just the bully with leverage. From Starfleet's description of her, it sounds like the chain has the same MO across over 50 other worlds, offering aid with a catch. This is in juxtaposition to the Federation's approach, as Rin points out how he grew up learning about how the UFP were liars and deceivers. Well, this is probably in response to the fact that the United Federation of Planets was forced to relinquish its protection over many worlds, and those planets would have felt rather betrayed as Starfleet withdrew. Unlike the Emerald Chain, however, which offers an open hand before slapping manacles on you, the Federation maintains its ethos of unconditional aid based on a moral obligation. This is a theme that we see reflected in Booker, or as we learn, Tarax, as he decides to commit to Discovery and the Greater Starfleet. The division between his home and not brother but brother was one remedied by good old fashioned Trek pseudoscience on behalf of the Federation. One touch I liked about the Space Druid Society that books from was the attention to detail in clothing and gear. The robe, like deep green garments that they all wear, look rustic and natural, and even their dart-throwing firearms are sculpted from wood, although the coats do look a little like bathrobes. Their empathic commune with nature that the brothers can do is framed as just that, a communion, not an order and it's very in keeping with the way Book was first introduced. Detmer finally gets over her fears of the joystick by being forced into the deep end as a reminder as to why she flew to begin with, and can I just say that she's wasted as a pilot of a cruiser-sized starship. Let her out in a more manoeuvrable ship more often. Maybe it's because she was forced to placate and inspire Rin that she found the inner reserves of motivation for herself, but I think we've seen the last of her responsibility-induced jitters. I like how these characters are getting their due. We got some last season with Awasakun, but let's not neglect the others, as at the moment Bryce and Reese seem to just share the same personality traits of calm, helpful and kind. I'd like to see more. In terms of Georgiou, I enjoyed the medical advancement on display with the idea of a scan at a completely atomic level, and we get some more information on her condition. I am having trouble seeing why Burnham has any affection for Georgiou beyond, ooh, she looks like someone I respected. The Terran's snippy behaviour is winning her no friends, and it seems like everyone is tolerating her, but I don't know why. Colbert takes it all in stride, good for him, and she's aware of the visions she's having, it seems, even if she doesn't want to share. We also have this weird rippling effect that overcomes her as she's seizing. I couldn't tell if this was the gel coating fruiting out, or her in actuality beginning to warp. If it was her, then what if this signal that's being emanated from the source of the burn is having some disrupting effect on her specifically because she's not native to this reality? Speaking of the burn's origin in the Verubin Nebula, many of us had already speculated that this mysterious song was tied into the burn, and sure enough it is. Exactly how is still unclear, but I'm suspicious that it could be the cause of the burn. Whatever the case, one of the underlying tones from this tune is that of a Federation distress signal, so the next stop in this mystery seems clear. 
but of course we have the looming threat of the Emerald Chain that's bound to get in the way first. On another note, we have to see how the Admiral will take Saru's rationalisations about not directly intervening with the Chain's attack on Quijan. I mean, he's not going to buy it, but this was a confrontation that Starfleet would have eventually had to deal with. Maybe now that they're aware that the Emerald Chain is running out of Dilithium, they can make some form of deal. But I think the Chain, or Osira, needs to go. Adira too gets another major step. They reveal to Stamets that even before the joining, they never felt comfortable being a she, and with the added layer of the symbiont memories, perhaps the pronoun selection is even more meaningful now. Nevertheless, I think Stamets' reaction is pretty appropriate as to how to approach this. Don't make it awkward, don't fuss over it, just simply accept it. Okay. Adira seemed hesitant enough to voice that, as it was. On top of this, we get the general confusion that a fresh host often experiences. We saw similar things with Esri Dax, who, like Adira, was an emergency selection and lacked the years of preparation that the Symbiosis Commission trains joining initiates for. Adira voices how they never know who they're going to be on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's good to see the continuing repercussions of such a life-altering event as a joining. Tilly is performing well so far as the number one. She deals with Rin's disgruntled demeanour well and seems to be able to manage the captain's spreadsheets. I like the subtle gag with Saru trying to find an alternative for engage, punch it or make it so, and although played for laughs it does kind of hint at the fact that Saru is still a relatively new captain, akin to when he asked the computer to compile files on outstanding Starfleet captains years ago. Then again, he does seem aware of how silly it is, and by the end of the episode I'm pretty sure he's warmly playing it for fun with the crew. Overall, it was a good time where the action scenes didn't overshadow the core themes of the episode, that being that the Federation is still trying to be a force for good despite all that's happened to it, even though it's diminished in both size and reputation. The trail to the burn continues, and now we've established the chain as the primary obstacle that stands in complete opposition to everything that Starfleet has been clinging to. This episode has a long cooldown after the battle, which does make me feel that this is the calm before the storm. So thanks for watching this review of Discovery's Episode 8. What do you think of the distress call? Past vessel? Stranded? an alternate mirror universe ISS discovery, or some form of spatial trap that just caught another vessel. I'm still thinking that this music was somehow the cause of the burn, and messed with space-time, but it could be something made manifest post-cataclysm. So thanks again, and until the next video I've been Rick and I'll see you again later. Goodbye.